from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Kelsey Anderson and Eric D. Wolf will team up to discuss the latest outlook on diseases in the current winter wheat crop, taking under consideration that extreme cold weather that took place in February. As part of that, they'll center on the deep freeze in Texas and how that might have affected our chances for rust disease issues in the Kansas wheat crop. Following then, K-State's Ignacio Ciampitti, offering some input on making final corn seeding decisions based on expected field conditions in the spring and early summer. He'll offer up considerations on planting dates, seeding rates, and row spacing. And ahead, another Stop, Look, and Listen with K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. That and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for listening. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Well, it's time now to give due consideration to the state of the winter wheat crop in Kansas and Not just from the moisture standpoint, which we've been talking of extensively of late, but as well the potential for disease troubles in this new crop, drawing from recent weather events that may have influenced that potential. Joining us now, Kelsey Anderson, wheat disease specialist with K-State Research and Extension, along with plant pathologist here at Kansas State University, Eric D. Wolf. They've been watching the situation closely and have some things to pass along to us. Kelsey, let's start with this. What do we know about wheat diseases that likely overwintered successfully? Yeah, sure. Great question, Eric. Thanks for having me here. So I guess there's a couple things to think about. We classified our diseases that do overwinter into a couple of buckets. We might put them in the the leaf spot residue borne diseases like our fusarium head blight and our tan spot and our septoria. And then we have our other foliar diseases like um, powdery mildew and our rust diseases, and they might have survived differently in this cold weather. So those pathogens like our tan spot and fusarium head blight have really nice um, survival structures. So they are in that corn or that wheat residue and they can survive pretty cold temperatures. Um, And so even if that cold snap did knock them back a little bit, that disease pressure will be mostly based on what the weather looks like coming up here in, in April and May. So if we have moisture in those months, that's when we'll really see those diseases kind of kick in. Uh, but it's a little different when we think about some of these other diseases like, like our leaf rust or our stripe rust. So even if there was some stripe rust that was surviving on some of that, that leaf tissue coming into this past freeze, most of that tissue might have been burned back by the cold. And that would have killed that inoculum. And we can also kind of look south at what happened and and think about how um, maybe rust would be in Texas, because we know that it rarely overwinters here, or if it does, it's at very low levels, but it does overwinter in Texas and it'll hopscotch its way up to us here in Kansas now over the spring. And we want to, in a few moments here, ask Eric to weigh in on the scene in Texas and how successfully rust diseases survived that deep cold weather, certainly for that part of the nation here uh, several weeks ago. In general, our wheat stands uh, are in iffy shape in certain locations. They've been quite parched for moisture. Does that make them more vulnerable to the array of wheat diseases, do you think? Well, that that might determine how much biomass there is. So a really dense stand, a really healthy stand might be very high yielding, but also can be very favorable for some of those leaf spotting diseases because it's easy to get a lot of moisture in the canopy. So something like tan spot or something like powdery mildew might really like that environment. So if we have a thinner stand, we could have slightly less chance at, at some of those diseases. But other than that, uh, as long as that 
didn't damage our growing point of the weed, we should still recover and, and shouldn't see too many disease implications from that, that recent cold snap. Let's bring Eric in, Eric D. Wolf. You have been expressly watching what's been going on in the Southern Plains and have collected some information, as we know to date, about rust diseases and whether they were able to survive that harsh cold weather that took place here about three weeks back now. Producers would be very excited to hear that rust didn't do so well in that weather. Sure. So I think there's a couple different factors. You know, over the years, uh, we've talked Eric, about uh, different research that we've been doing over the years and how uh, kind of the conventional wisdom really uh, has us focused this time of year on uh, what's happening in the the deep south. And for our region, that particularly means Texas and some scientists believe Mexico as well. Probably the main drivers of that overall rust throughout the Great Plains, Southern Great Plains region is probably moisture. Moisture availability research would would indicate, and particularly beginning in the fall, in uh, October, November, December, and then transitioning to this time of year, January, February, and and even early March, are really key time periods for wheat crop regionally as well. The status of the wheat crop and the moisture availability is tightly linked, it appears, with these rust diseases getting a foothold in the region as well. So if we look back at at what was happening last fall and what we know of of the last few months, it sure appears that uh, dry conditions throughout the fall and the last few months may well be uh, holding these rust diseases in check. Particularly, it seems like uh, November, October, November were were drier than average in in Texas. Uh, And then a little more moisture came through uh, uh, parts of southern Texas, parts of northern Texas, if you remember more recently, as, as maybe Dallas was uh, and some other areas were receiving snow and freezing rain and different things. And so it's not until just recently that uh, they started to receive moisture and that may uh, uh, stimulate a little bit of activity. Bottom line is, though, it seems like the, we're tending towards dryness uh, here in Kansas and throughout the region probably will translate to a lower than average risk for striped rust and possibly leaf rust in the 2021 growing season. Stressing, that's a possibility. (laughs) Things could change, but if the forecast holds, rust may be a a lesser threat. And and we'll talk about what that would portend for one's management here in just a second. Other pathogens, and one that comes to mind immediately here, Kelsey, wheat streak mosaic, which is often predicated by the amount of volunteer wheat that is left around going into the fall and then the winter What are you hearing on that front here in Kansas? We had um, some reports of volunteer wheat that was maybe a little above average there in in September and even early October, you know, which which is what we call that green bridge. So some of those curl mites that survive on last year's crop might hop into that volunteer and then survive long enough to infect the, the newly established crop. So we did have reports that there were probably higher than average levels of volunteer just because of the levels of moisture. So we're really going to keep an eye on on wheat streak mosaic uh, levels this year. So as a reminder, those fields that got infected early after establishment, right? So those fields that were infected right after planting or very early in the season are the ones that are most likely to have the highest damage, the highest yield loss. So I guess the moisture issues that we had are are bad news for producers, but could be good news for Wheat Streak Mosaic because we had um, several places in Kansas where wheat wasn't um, able to come up until late, even in December, some even now in the spring because of lack of moisture. And those fields likely escaped those early infections, even if there was a curl mite problem or there was some Wheat Streak Mosaic pressure in the area. So those would probably be at a lower risk uh, because of the environmental conditions for wheat streak coming into this season. So so that was another thing that should just be taken into consideration as we're scouting for wheat streak coming into the season. Thinking about all of this collectively then, it would seem that disease pressure might be, in general now, lighter on the Kansas winter wheat crop. Is that to say 
and this is said tongue-in-cheek, but producers should let their guard down as far as managing against diseases. What do you both think about the approach that producers might at least contemplate here? Yeah, so we certainly have our fingers crossed here that it's a low disease year, but we want to be prepared um, because, like I mentioned earlier, some of it will really depend what the weather looks like here in April, especially when we're talking about some of those residue-borne diseases, Weather around flowering will be really important for fusarium head blight. So it's not time to let our guards down just yet. Uh, we'll be out scouting, I know, over the next coming weeks and into April to, to try to find those first events of those rust diseases, um, especially stripe rust. So I would just keep an ear out and, and we'll keep our eyes open and keep kind of scouting as the season goes on. But again, fingers crossed that it will be a low disease year. And Eric, you would concur? Sounds like good advice. Yeah, I think so. I think remaining vigilant is, is always a, a good move at this time of year. We've certainly seen years in the past where it started out very dry, but like Kelsey's indicating it, the range can start in April or even May and uh, greatly increase our yield potential of our wheat. But uh, often close on its heels is uh, rust diseases or, or other pathogens that would also be favored by those same conditions. Well, it's about that time of year where here on this broadcast we start monitoring with some regularity what's going on with the good help of you two. So we will talk it up as we find out more about disease threats to the Kansas winter wheat crop moving forward. Thanks for joining us, both of you, Eric and Kelsey. You're welcome. Oh, thanks for having us. From the Plant Pathology Department here at Kansas State University, Extension Wheat Disease Specialist Kelsey Anderson and Plant Pathologist Eric B. Wolf. Well, we'll change gears for our next segment and talk corn production and some things for you corn growers to add to your pre-plant considerations as that time to roll out the planters is drawing ever nearer. That's next here on the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, corn planting time in Kansas is just not all that far off within a matter of weeks. In advance of that, we catch up once again with crop production and cropping systems specialist Ignacio Ciampitti, K-State Research and Extension, for some considerations on seeding this new crop corn. And Ignacio, some of the key things that we will bring up here, corn populations and and row spacing and the like, but in general, as you look ahead to our planting window here, what do the prospects look like? It's been dry around parts of Kansas. How are you viewing this upcoming season? Well, as always, Eric, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it it looks like, as every year we say, that it looks like it will be a good challenge. And if you look at the current situation of soil moisture in many parts of the state. We have a few spots where we, we, we have, I would say, adequate, but overall we are more towards the lower end. Not having a good precipitation in the next coming weeks and the prospects also potential of changes on temperature, it doesn't look like a, to have a very good early season crop. So it's probably just a, a point of cautious for many of our farmers to think about temperature forecast. And then if we start looking at the potential influence of dry conditions, we always discuss about these dry versus wet soil conditions. I mean, we need to first start pointing out that dry soils, they tend to fluctuate temperature much faster. Okay, So if soil temperature today is around 55 degrees, if we have a dry condition, as we have in many of our soils, if temperatures go down, that temperature will drop very fast. And in many situations, wet soils are buffering much more those changes and oscillations of temperature, air temperatures. Mm-hmm. 
today our dry soils, they will change temperature just in a week, and they could drop very easily 10 or 15 degrees very quickly. Implications of a lack of uniformity, which is very critical for corn. Implications of potential issues of those plants not coming up, problems of emergence, seed treatments that they don't do well because of the long standing seeds on the on the on the field. So I would more be on the cautious side of being getting too excited yet. <laughs> In other words, well be sure that those soil temperatures are consistently above what that fifty degree mark. Uh, don't plant too early, the message there. Yeah, and also think about that we are entering many many fields with dry soils, very dry soils, mm-hmm. which means that we also will find spots in the fields where conditions of moisture will be good and some areas of the field where we will see very dry situations. Soils that they are too dry, they tend to fluctuate on temperatures really fast. So if today we are in 55 or getting closer to a 55, 60, which I consider to be more closer to the optimal, those temperatures could change very fast if next week we would drop back to 40 degrees or 32 degrees. And those changes, air temperature change, it will be reflected much faster in dry soils than in wet soil conditions. That's one of the main points. Again, as I mentioned, the implications of uniformity. We already have a lot of information showing that uh, planting too early, if soil conditions are not optimal, we will see corn being delayed, taking sometimes 20, 25 days to emerge, as compared to a condition that will be on mid-April or late April, where we have those 60 or 65 degrees at two inch, and then you will see that corn coming up in sometimes seven to 10 days. Okay? And when you look at the overall growing season or difference on planting dates, most likely you will find not a lot of difference between or too early or something that was planted by mid or too late April, just as a matter of cautious there on, on the planting side. What about aligned with this seeding rate, the population rate one shoots for again if you're in a dry land system and the prospects are that it will be a drier than normal growing season, does one alter their population intentions here? Excellent question. I mean, we know that seeding rate is uh, one of the largest costs for corn production. So if you start thinking on that point, what is the risk that farmers are taking if they want to be aggressive? This growing season, when we are seeing that first you are starting the growing season with a potential very dry soil conditions. So what is expected yield potential? And today we'll be talking probably of being more on the defensive side rather than being progressive. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about your seeing rates, Think about the risk that you are taking by going into higher seeing rates. If you go into really higher seeing rates and if the situation doesn't improve over time, then our risk on going on that higher seeing rate is higher because we are adding more plants when, in fact, that environment, that field, will not be able to support that many number of plants. If you go to the opposite side, being more on the conservative or defensive, so defensive practice, If we go on the lower side, your risk will be reduced. But we also need to think about what are the conditions if during the next month precipitation improves and we start getting more moisture. So as you see, the the kind of it's it's a gambling and then the gambling is like I want to be more aggressive and have a high risk or I want to be more defensive and just reduce my risk as much as possible. And considering that on the scene rate, we have enough information until this point telling us that based on your yield target, if you are in a 300 bushel or 250, the scene rate really matches very well your yield environment. So for higher yield potential, for those guys that are trying to shoot for 250, 300, those guys, they will try to go to higher scene rates. For the guys that are trying just on the... 150 or even below than that, those guys will go to the lower side. They will go with 20,000 or even less than 20,000 seeds per acre. And I think that this is where that risk that we discussed before, if I'm in an environment that is very susceptible to drought and then my yield potential is 150 or 100 bushels, you know that in those environments you might need to play a little more conservative 
to make sure that you have possibilities of making good yields. If you are in environments that they are on the high yielding side and you are shooting for 30 or 35,000, I would say, again, more conservative and trying to make sure that you go into potentially the lowest side. And those are the ways that I will start thinking on matching your seeing rate based on your yield target, but also think about that it's not about a number. It's usually about a range mm-hmm. of seeing rate. And associated with this, then, it would seem not advisable to alter row spacings as we're looking at a drier growing season. In other words, likely staying with that 30-inch row spacing would be advisable in most cases. And I would say yes, because we have many farmers that they already have the limitation from the equipment size. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really hard to get equipment that is on 20-inch. And then if you look at this situation, we usually have, in many, in many cases, based on uh, data, we have situations where we are seeing potential benefits of narrowing rows, but in many cases, those benefits are clearly visual when we are moving into high yields, which means 200 to 150 plus which means that in situations that we are in 250 less, 150, those environments, the narrow rows doesn't seem to have a potential impact on the yield side. And by looking and thinking on this, in fact, in so many situations, if we narrow too much the rows and go into 15s or or other type of narrow rows, and if we are going into dry conditions, we can have a negative impact because those plants will tend to use compete early in the season The competition is not only for light above the ground, but it's also below the ground on the roots. And that competition will be for water and nutrients, extremely depending on the precipitations. And if precipitations are not there by the time that the corn is flowering, that corn will be extremely susceptible to any conditions. I mean, and drought, we have seen already a lot of data that extremely drought situations around flowering, we can lose between 30 to 50 percent of yields just two or three weeks around flowering time. The other factor that we probably can briefly discuss, which is something that we always see a connection, is the fertilization with nitrogen. Think about those inputs when you are deciding your seeding rate. You also need to match your nitrogen fertilization. So for high yield environments, and if you want to push, you will be pushing both seeding rate and nitrogen fertilization. If you are playing more conservative and defensive, we will also do the same with the nitrogen fertilization. So we will try to be adjusting those rates based on what is our potential target yield. As we get closer to actual planting time, we will try to touch base with you once again, Ignacio, for some last-minute advice on those fertility rates and other inputs, as we might have, at that point, a better idea of how this early part of the growing season is going to shake out. Thanks for now for those comments. We will catch up with you again soon. Take care, Ignacio. Thanks, Eric. He's Ignacio Ciampitti, Crop Production and Cropping Systems Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Preliminary thoughts on seeding that new corn crop, which will begin in earnest here a little over a month from now, roughly, thereabouts, depending on where you are in the state. We'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. Make hand-washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. That March 15th deadline for enrollment in the Ag Risk Coverage and Price Loss Coverage Safety Net programs is approaching 
coming Monday, and there's still a fair percentage of farmers, we're told, that have not yet been enrolled nationally, according to the Farm Service Agency. The FSA says that 1.4 million farms have been enrolled in the program, about 81 percent of what the agency says is typical enrollment of 1.7 million farms, that only 2.3 million in the U.S. that have base acres. The level of agency announced Monday is up from 1.2 million as of March the 1st. FSA offices in many instances have used appointments that go beyond the March 15th deadline. Those are going to be considered uh, as a register for enrollment. The FSA said that counties are not to use a register unless the producer requests an appointment after March the 15th or the county cannot complete the activity by March the 15th. All enrolled contracts are required to be approved within 30 calendar days after the enrollment deadline and those on the register are to be completed as soon as possible after that Monday, March 15th deadline. Well, there were a few changes from last month in the USDA's latest grain supply and demand forecasts posted yesterday. Here's a recap from the USDA's Gary Crawford. Usually, the March edition of USDA Supply and Demand Forecasts is not very exciting, not what you would call March madness. And on Tuesday, the analyst at USDA used the words unchanged from last month many times, at least on the U.S. side. For wheat, same U.S. outlook, ending stocks projected at 836 million bushels, price averaging $5. World wheat numbers did change a bit. USDA raising global production to 776.8 million tons, a record high, and adding over 6.5 million tons to expected global consumption, taking it to a record just under 776 million tons. Meanwhile, most analysts thought maybe USDA this month would reduce its ending stocks forecast for U.S. corn and beans, but no. USDA is still looking for 120 million bushels of soybeans to be left over at the end of the year. The price forecast still at last month's 11.15 a bushel. Also, no change to USDA's projected corn ending stocks, still at just over 1.5 billion bushels. Some traders were looking for a little lower figure than that. Corn price projected still at 4.30 a bushel. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And by the way, we will break down even further that USDA WASDE report tomorrow right here when the senior economist with the IGP Institute here at K-State, Guy Allen, will be Mike's side. A federal lawsuit challenging the EPA's approval of atrazine and two related herbicides, propazine and simazine, has been stayed as part of the Biden administration's review of Trump administration actions. That lawsuit was filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco last November by the Rural Coalition, the Pesticide Action Network, North America, Beyond Pesticides, and other groups. Those groups allege the EPA violated its duties under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act when the agency released its interim registration of the three pesticides last September. Now, environmental groups have lobbied for atrazine to be banned entirely based on concerns about human health risks and environmental problems, particularly concerning water quality. Syngenta, the registrant and primary manufacturer of atrazine, has intervened in the case, the EPA saying it's possible that in response to the review that the EPA may undertake actions that could resolve some or all of the issues in the case. Again, that stated by the EPA in its motion to stay, our parties agreed to this day, the judges did approve the motion. Atrazine, of course, a herbicide widely used in agriculture across a range of crops, primarily corn, but also grain sorghum. The herbicide is under re-registration review by the EPA. Back in September, the agency released an interim registration decision approving its continued use and announced some new requirements for atrazine. Now, the agency is finalizing the label requirements for all three triazines to include mandatory spray drift control measures aiming to minimize pesticide drift into the non-target areas. Label directions also being updated to slow weed resistance to atrazine. And new label language will prohibit spraying during a temperature inversion, as well as setting a 15-mile-per-hour wind speed restriction for aerial and ground applications and adding specific boom and nozzle requirements. Amidst a growing concern for a lack of veterinary services in rural Kansas, a group of statewide organizations and higher education leadership have combined their resources to form a task force. Scarlett Higgins tells us more about this effort. 
The objective of the Rural Veterinary Workforce Development Task Force is to promote the growth and retention of veterinarians to ensure a long-term adequate supply of rural practitioners to serve the needs of agricultural communities across the state. To accomplish this, the task force needs to first understand what gaps exist and learn more about why there is a lack of access to veterinary support in rural areas. Therefore, an online survey has been created for producers to provide feedback on these issues. It should take less than five minutes to complete and can be accessed by going to bit.ly backslash rural vet workforce survey. All survey responses are anonymous and voluntary. The responses gathered will help the task force create a strategy to solve the issue, whether it pertains to specific services or a lack of people to perform those services. The information also will be used at the educational level to help in the evaluation of both curriculum and admission policies. In addition to the Kansas Livestock Association, other members of the task force include the Kansas Farm Bureau, Kansas Department of Agriculture, Kansas Veterinary Medical Association, Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and Kansas State University College of Agriculture. I'm Scarlett Hagens. And lastly, in the headlines today, the use of E30 ethanol in state of Nebraska non-flexible fuel vehicles for one year found no observable negative effects on vehicle performance or costs per mile. That's according to the results of a study released by that state on Monday. It also found because E30 is about 2.5% less expensive than E15, the wide use of E30 would make it a more economically viable fuel. What's more, the study found that non-flexible fuel vehicles were able to adjust to the air-to-fuel ratio to adapt to E30's higher oxygen content. This year-long demonstration involved 50 uh, non-flexible fuel vehicles from the state of Nebraska to determine its adaptability, its feasibility, and the environmental effect of E30. 26 vehicles fueled by E15 and 24 by E30. The increase in ethanol concentration does not cause engine coolant temperature to change significantly. That's according to the University of Nebraska analysis of those study results. Gus Vanderhoven checks in for his weekly commentary. That is next here on Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. My son needed the tools to check the fence on the farm. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. This is tough, really tough. Down under we would say, it's bloody tough, mate. For a moment one has to be careful not to feel sorry for oneself, but it's a fact of life. And as I said last week, it is what it is. My son stopped by on Friday to pick up the fencing tools and chainsaws. The one chainsaw I gave him a few weeks ago when I told him that saw was now too heavy for me to use. He also took the small one. I want to hold onto that one a little longer. There's no reason to feel sorry for yourself, but I have to admit there was a moment I had to swallow. I did feel sorry for myself. Many, many years ago, I heard a farmer speaking about his neighbor, very respectfully. But the neighbor was old, an old farmer. And suddenly, I feel I'm there. My son needed the tools to check the fence on the farm. He wanted to take his grandson this past weekend and do the job to make it more secure for the cows. I helped him sort the buckets with chainsaw stuff and the clips. I told him where to find extra steel posts. 
He took the role of barbed wire, the crowbar, the pounder, and more. It was the stuff we would load when we would go to the farm to do some fencing work. Years ago, when we bought the farm, he and I built the half-mile fence where there was no fence. It was an up-and-down fence through the drawers. We built it strong absolutely straight fence and apply to old practice how to sight when you cannot see either end. We did not have laser or other modern equipment. We used our eyes and brain. We have a straight five-wire fence. I remember our neighbor came rumbling down one time on his tractor to see how we were doing. I expect he was wondering how good of a fence we put up. I think he was satisfied. He's a good neighbor. He, too, is getting older. I know Guido, my son, will do a very good job, and Everett will help him. Everett is his grandson, my great-grandson. The glass is half full when you think about it and can say to yourself, I'm still around. Whenever I've taken an old fence down, I think about the men and women who built it many years ago. I say women because both my daughters have helped me. We do not have the modern equipment to make work light. We are not afraid to dig that hole with the crowbar and the clapping post hole digger. Even if you do have a tractor with the post hole digger, you still have to clean the hole out with the old hand digger. Oh, and then the rocks. Just sitting here, I can hear and feel the rumbling of the tractor when the digger hits the rock and pries it loose, or hits that solid rock and no longer can dig down. Actually, on a nice day, fencing can be a joy. When it's all done and you know corner posts are set deep and stamped properly, you feel very satisfied. I know. I've done plenty of it. I can't do it anymore, and I should not. My shoulders and other joints are shot. I'm grateful Guido picked up all the tools to fix it. After this summer's grazing, we will decide what to do. There's too little time to replace the whole fence now. Also, certain sections are still good. The old fence runs along the road, up the hill, and along the top and down again. It is Flint Hills country. Just ask Jonas when we built a mile plus internal fence. It went zigzag up and down. We put plenty of sturdy gates into it to have easy access. We built it strong. Of course, all fences do need attention. Sometimes a tree has fallen on the fence and Cows will know. So the day you go and check the cows, you see them coming down the county road as if they were going to church. What amazes me is that when you stop them and turn them around, they will trundle back like kids, caught and go straight back to where they broke out. It's amazing. Who calls them stupid cows? Forget it. They are smart. A few weeks ago, I called my neighbor and told him two of his cows were on our side of the fence. They were on the burnt part. Surely, no green grass there. I've always liked the rules standing in the middle of a boundary fence. To the right, it's used to maintain, and to the left, the neighbors. I have part of a fence like that, but the neighbor lives far out of state. When Guido and Everett are working, I'll stay away. I think they will have a good time together. I can hear them chatting, laughing, and telling jokes like I used to do. You know, until I went to Australia, I never used a crowbar to dig a hole. We used a heavy pounding hammer and hammered a wooden pole into the ground. Sometimes the post would send up green shoots, especially if it was a willow post. And we did use heavier willow branches for light posts cut from the pollard willows standing along the narrow drainage ditches 
and waterways. I still remember digging fence posts, holes in Australia, using the crowbar. It was work, steady work. When I came to Kansas, I appreciated the Osage orange trees. All my posts are Osage orange. Have a go at it, Everett. It will build muscle. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That'll do it for our Wednesday edition. Thanks, as always, for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.